So before we get started, uh, Dr. Watkins, the principal of Bunch Middle School, said he needed to talk to you about his student loan when you <laughs> get finished. Um, you know, some of you were wondering about the things he was saying and is it important? Let me explain, or they say my grew up, let me explain um, the substance of what's going on here. Every word that he said had been scripted, refined, gone over by a, a fine tooth comb because when the Fed speaks, the world listens. listens. The fact that he came here, I asked him to come here. I figured he'd come here during the normal schedule. His schedule didn't permit. In order to do it, he had to come here this evening. I've never in my life, in 25 years, seen a Federal Reserve anything, yet alone the vice chairman, show up basically at an evening party to give a speech. That's how dedicated. <laughs> It's the little things that matter the most. Last thing I'll say, and, and he has to be, because he's in this position now, very comported. But let me say this. I knew him in the private sector. About 10 years ago, when no one paid me any attention, Ambassador Young, I called him trying to get into another company whose name I won't say. But he used to have an association. And I said, I need to talk to somebody over there about Operation Hope. Now, he wasn't working there anymore. And he was off to something else. He wrote an email to the guy. You need to see John Bryant. Blind copied me. No response. He wrote a second email. No response. Two weeks later, I called him again. He picked up the phone, called the guy. No response. About a month later, thinking I'd gone away, I'm sure, I called him again. This time, <laughs> This time he calls another person in the company. I'm sure, by the way, now that he's vice chairman of the Federal Reserve, they're thinking a little different about this whole exchange. <laughs> no response. They never responded. But he never gave up. <laughs> no one knows that story. He would never tell you that story. It never amounted to a check coming to me. It never amounted to a grant to Operation Hope. This is not a positive story with a, a marching band or beautiful uh, blossoms of empowerment. No. Effectively, it was a failure. <laughs> Except that behind closed doors, when nobody was watching, I saw what this man was made of and what he does when nobody's paying attention 10 years before he was Federal Reserve Vice Chairman. And that's why he's here, he's here today. And let me thank you for that, Jim. And, and let me say that we got a lot of city people here from a lot of cities all over the world. But Atlanta has been a city that somehow found a way to run its business through the private sector. And our airport, for instance, basically went, came from Wall Street. And uh, our sewer system, we floated bonds. Mm -hmm. uh, the building of the new stadium there that our mayor has been very much influenced, I mean, influential in. I mean, almost everything here has worked with the private sector, but there are very few other cities that do it that way. And I'm wondering, will this work anywhere? Or is it, there's, there's something special about us. And you don't need to flatter us. We're trying to, <laughs> we got to keep it going. Well, I, I, I think the answer to that question is both, which is that there's clearly something special about Atlanta and that you've seen that that can work and you've made it work. Uh, I think that the success of Atlanta in using the private sector to further public purposes uh, is an example that many, many cities could learn from. I mean, there are, are cities that, you know, some decades ago you might have thought were essentially peer cities to Atlanta that have not grown and prospered and thrived in the way that Atlanta has. And myself, uh, you know, I, I believe that a significant portion of that is the way that Atlanta has approached growth in a private sector positive way. Well, now, we're looking also at the future. And um, 
we've got something called opportunity zones that came out of the last mm -hmm. treasury bill. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've always had enterprise zones. And I don't know how we created them. I, my, my predecessor, Maynard Jackson, just designated something as enterprise zones. And we've been able to give local tax breaks and uh, put in streets and, and water and lights and everything so that we were ready for business moving in. We also, I understand, have about $4 billion worth of building permits that have already been issued this year. And uh, I, I mean, it's almost like it scares me because they're putting up buildings too fast and I don't know where the people are coming from. <laughs> uh, and I, I was comfortable with you know, with two million people, and now we've got six and a half million people. So I almost want somebody else to do something to take some folks somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> and ease the traffic. I don't know how else we can do it. So let me ask you a question, Mr. Vice Chairman. The role of the Fed, what is your opinion when I say to people that 70% of the economy is consumer spending? To me, that's poor folks, working class folks, folks with too much month at the end of their money, struggling folks. Uh, what role does the working class, the so-called poor, the struggling middle class have with a vibrant economy, number one? And number two, is, is it possible that the Community Reinvestment Act could be something other than just a way to respect the poor and underserved neighborhoods, but actually could be used very seriously as a tool for economic growth and GDP by inspiring investors in the 100 million people with maybe a blemish on their record, but once they refine themselves, could actually contribute to the economy. Is it uh, fanciful to think that this could be a serious part of Fed discussion? No, I don't think that's, uh, that's not uh, fanciful at all. I, as you, you know, as you know, uh, consumer spending, uh, the consumer part of the economy is an extremely important part of what drives our economy, and our, our economy is an extremely important part of what drives the global economy. Uh, and including everyone in that economy uh, and ensuring that they have the freedom to pursue the opportunities that are presented to them uh, by being supported uh, through a, a fair financial sector that's providing credit to, uh, you know, that's allocating credit fairly, that's, uh, that's critical to a strong economy. I mean, the, we're seeing now, so the overall unemployment rate in the United States is, is heading towards as low as it's been in half a century. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are still significant disparities uh, within subgroups. Uh, uh, within that, uh, you know, African American, Hispanic, m minority uh, unemployment is still materially higher, even though it's also lower than it was, materially higher than it is for other groups. Uh, so I think, you know, the more that we can bring everyone into a strong economy that makes the economy stronger, we all benefit from their contributions to the economy, it's all part of, uh, of the macro picture. So it's not just a question of fairness, it's not just a question I don't want to say that that's just, it's not just a question of justice, but it's also a question of ensuring that the economy is working as strongly as it can be. We, all of those people are, are important to it. On the CRA question, I mean, if you go back to the law itself, the law, the, the Community Reinvestment Act is precisely that. It's to encourage banks uh, to invest in the development of their communities, yep. including low and minority income communities. Yep but to invest in their development. Now, over time, a supervisory practice has developed that sort of views certain types of projects as sort of very clearly favored. And so the banks look at those types of projects and the supervisors look at those type of projects and say, this counts, that's easy, you know, end of, end of thought. Right. Uh, but the statute itself has a much broader uh, purpose. Uh, and I think, as you suggest, I think there is definitely opportunity for uh, for rethinking how you could use the Community Reinvestment Act to be a broader catalyst for development. So tying this back into Ambassador Young, your history with the Civil Rights Movement, 
your work with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in these southern towns, what people don't know, maybe you can illuminate them, tying this all together. Civil rights and civil rights were always the same conversation because the majority of the customers in these small towns were, at that point, African American. And when the economy got shut down, it hurt the business sector. And you weren't trying to hurt the business sector. Dr. King wasn't. But it got everybody's attention. And you would go meet with the business leaders after the marching behind closed doors, as I understand, to cut a deal to get the whites well, on the side. It really wasn't a deal. It was just our understanding of civil rights was, according to Dr. King, that we, were, we wanted to share responsibility for our own segregation, that it would not be able to exist if we didn't pay for it. Mm. And when we decided not to pay for it, it had to change. And my job was sort of to go to sit down and just ha have a no-fault analysis. We're not blaming anybody, but if you have that sign, black water, and white water, then we're not going to spend our money here anymore. And it's amazing how quick those signs came down. <laughs> uh, and, and, but I, I think that was, um, and, and I, I look at Birmingham now, and Birmingham is booming. Uh, Memphis was in the dumps for a long time, and Memphis, just this last week, finally recognized the sanitation workers. And they put up, a, I think, a $50,000 something bonus to help them who didn't have pensions back. But I'm saying when you, when you put money into the economy to help the poor, then it raises everybody. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, that's been our challenge here. Uh, and I think we've, we've tried to do the best we could, but the reason I'm concerned about other cities so much is we're doing so, we're, we're doing so good, everybody wants to come here. And it's, it's sort of like uh, Willie Brown in San Francisco. I mean, he had post office boxes, and he gave the homeless a check and every, every month. And they registered the homeless, but homeless people kept coming. Uh, and they are always picking in him. <laughs> and I think that's for not doing enough. And I think that's the reason we need to see regional, and that's why we're glad you're here, because the, the Fed here uh, is, is a meeting place for almost everybody. Uh, and it's, it's always been a part of our economic development, and it works well with neighborhoods and banks. And, and, and I think we know the importance of your, your business. And we're glad to have somebody with your private sector background there. And uh, we just need, we need to find ways to help other cities. And I hope, that's why I'm glad John has brought people from all over the nation to this place. Because not to show off what we're doing, but to try to get some help. That's what Martin Luther King gave his life for, that we could end poverty. And government alone can never do that. And I think John has introduced to me even to the idea that um, a 700 credit score is another way to define freedom. So, somebody I can wrap this up as we come to a close here, some themes. I have said that you've never seen a riot in a 700 credit score community in your entire life. <laughs> the 700 credit score communities don't riot, they just want to go shopping. <laughs> Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, we refuse to finance our own oppression. Ambassador Andrew Young has said two things I think are sort of incredibly important. One is, you can, it, to live in a system of free enterprise and not to understand the rules of free enterprise must be the very definition of slavery. And then when he was in Africa, and I tagged along with him, he said to African leaders, 18 of them, you can make more money honestly in a growing economy than you can steal from a dying economy.
And to me, I'm bringing that back down to what you've now just said, that Community Reinvestment Act can be a catalyst, not just a nice thing to do because of human dignity, but can be a catalyst for genuine, authentic economic growth. And what I'm hearing you say is that the poor and the underserved have a legitimate role to play in the growth of the economy of the United States of America. Unquestioned. It appears we're on the same page, <laughs> which is remarkable in 2018 anywhere. Uh, well, you have people who are basically financially, I mean, they've learned or they wouldn't be here. Right. And I think our job and our responsibility is we've kind of learned to end our own poverty. Now, how do we continue Dr. King's dream and end poverty for the least of these God's children, wherever they might be, and help them not only to have jobs, but to learn to save money, invest yeah. money? Uh, I, I brag about our mayor yeah. and her husband because uh, they did pretty good buying Home Depot stock at $2 a share when they first got out of law school. Right. And they're doing pretty good, and everybody couldn't understand. I said, they're doing the same thing that uh, Arthur Blank and, and Bernie Marcus did, and they got to be billionaires. So you can stay in politics, and if you buy stock, instead of shoes and <laughs> wigs and <laughs> hold on, Ewa. hold on, hold on, hold on. You're getting, you're getting close. And, and you know, I mean, if you, if you buy the company instead of the goods, you become an owner, an investor, and then you, you got money working for you rather than you working for money. <laughs> and money always does better than you can do. <laughs> That's now, what I'm, I learned from John Bryan. <laughs> Don't blame it on me. You're talking about and my mama. You, 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 you're on your own on that one. <laughs> you, you about to step way over the line. Um, I heard some, I saw some ladies going to wait a minute, Matthew. Uh, let me uh, let me see if I can bring this home. Um, She's calling us. Yeah, and and and, and Fed Fed Vice Chairman, you get the, the last word. I, look, I've known this man for a long time. We need an advocate in these rooms. We need somebody who is speaking for us in, these, in the halls of power, who is remembering that the poor and the underserved have a legitimate role to play. George Frazier, you would agree with what I'm saying here. I think Reverend Jesse Jackson would agree, he's coming next, with what we're saying here, that we need somebody who cares about our agenda, who is thoughtful and intelligent and engaged. So I'm, this is a bit of a stretch. I'm going to acknowledge that. But I actually really like you and respect you, because I want you to be a full advocate, a full card-carrying advocate when you go in these, these rooms of power. Today, I think you're so cool, I've just made you an honorary black man. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that, we're done. Thank you.